fun. Well, thank you everybody for being here this Wednesday. My name is Jenna Maliti. I am an education advocacy intern with the Media Education Lab, and welcome to another summer webinar. Uh, this is Understanding Young People's Emotions, a practical guide to countering disinformation with Fake No More with Alexandra Moncos. This webinar will run for one hour. It will be recorded and posted to our website and YouTube channel. So if anybody has to step out early, you can find the rest of it there. Um, as I said, there will be a Q&A portion at the end, so please keep yourselves muted until then, but feel free to turn on your camera and leave any questions or comments in the chat. I will read out any questions at the end. Uh, so today, I am very excited to share that we are joined by Alexandra Mancos. Alexandra is a media and information literacy specialist and a project manager at the Fact Checking Academy and Demagogue Association in Poland. With expertise in combating disinformation, she focuses on media education and pre-bunking. She's the author of educational materials aimed at countering disinformation for teachers, and she is a trainer conducting fact-checking workshops. She's also a lecturer at Adam uh, Mikiarvich University. Uh, we are incredibly grateful that she is here with us today. So thank you very much, Alexandra, and I will hand things off to you. Hello, everyone. Happy to see you, happy to meet you. Thank you for joining us. My name is Alexandra Monko. Thank you, Jenna, for introducing me. I'm working for the Magok Association, which is the first, oldest and biggest fact-checking uh, non-government organization in Poland. And previously I worked uh, at the university. And today I will be, I am happy to share with you the outcomes of one of our uh, projects, the project that we are especially proud of because it concerns emotions. So please feel free to share your questions, comments, uh, remarks on chat during the presentation. Uh, I will go back to them later. We will also have the opportunity to um, have a little Q&A session at the breakout room. So hope you enjoy. So can I share the screen right now? Go ahead. Okay. Good. Okay. All right. So can you see the screen? Looks good. Yes. Okay, great. So the project that I will be uh, then happy to share with you uh, is called Fake No More. And uh, we'll be discussing and understanding young people's uh, emotion. And I'm thrilled to present a practical guide to countering this information with fake uh, no more. So maybe let's start with briefly with um, some of the information about the project. The fake no more is a media literacy project designed for educators teachers, librarians working with young people, especially with those from disadvantaged backgrounds. That was our initial idea. Uh, the project uh, was implemented because it has just ended by four nonprofit organizations from uh, Europe, school with class foundation, also from Poland, the Magok Association, uh, also from Poland, Fakescape from Czechia, Smile Mundo from Spain and Ad Faber from Romania. That was our consortium. And uh, the mentioned partner organizations developed um, the, activity, the activity scenario called Understand Emotions, Become Resilient to Disinformation, and the whole teaching methodology to diverse contexts, both schools. And, uh, but also non-school contexts like therapeutic centers, childcare homes, also for street workers, very different contexts. The materials are uh, quite universal, as we found out. Um, they are effective up across uh, different countries. For now, they are available in Polish, that was the original language. Then in, uh, trans they uh, has been translated to English, but also our Czech, Romanian and Spanish partners both tested the activities, localized them and translated to Czech, Romanian and uh, Spanish. The teaching materials consist of tools like activity scenarios, videos that I also going to show you later, the card game Octogram, 
and all are designed to build self-awareness and resilience to both myths and disinformation. Uh, uh, they are dedicated to the group of uh, young uh, people. So as you can see also on the slide, uh, they have a quite pretty, uh, this is my opinion, uh, design that we try to keep um, uh, in all of the activities, all of the site materials, such as the YouTube uh, videos. Okay. So um, the curriculum, that this is how we call the um, this publication with the scenario activities, uh, is divided into uh, five main chapters. Uh, you can see here the, um, the covers of each chapter. There are five of them, and it, each of them has a different color and also different uh, leading uh, question. Uh, it includes 16 shorter and longer activities and mentioned board gate, game uh, octogram. Each cut chapter has this leading question and focuses on uh, one thematic area. The curriculum was prepared by expert duos. Uh, I had the chance to participate in those uh, works. So if you have any uh, questions related to how we uh, combine our educational and fact-checking perspectives, then again, you can ask those questions on the chat. Then experts were specializing in disinformation, co-created the materials and the ideas for the, uh, for the activities with experts who are working um, with youth on the daily basis. So the ones that are working both at schools, but also in um, aforementioned, uh, for example, therapeutic uh, centers. The pink chapter, the first one, has the leading question, how do I feel? And is also marked by heart that focus, and it focuses on our emotions. The second chapter is yellow. And the leading question is, how do I think? and is marked as a circle symbolizing a head. The head because it reflects on so-called slow and fast thinking. And all the um, activities are related to those two types of, uh, of thinking. The blue chapter, so the third one, uh, is titled, How do I see the world? And it's marked by the eye. So it also corresponds with some of the body parts. And the chapter focuses on our cognitive biases. and uh, a couple of exercises that are included in the chapter are all devoted to uh, increasing our self-understanding in the field of cognitive biases that we all experience to some extent. The uh, next chapter, the um, gray one, uh, has a leading question, how do I react? And it's marked by a triangle symbolizing breath. So this, this is the one exception that we uh, don't use the body part, but it's also something that comes out of our body, that is breath. And this breath focuses well-being, allowing us or the children that are doing the, um, the, the activities to keep distance on the internet and avoid misinformation. And the last uh, chapter, the green, uh, has a leading question, what do I do? It's marked as a diamond and focuses our activities on social media. So what do what do we do? Where are we going um, when, when when we are spending time online? Uh, and the green chapter involves the board game Octogram. Oh, uh, so these are the uh, the the um, explained thematic areas of each of the each of the chapters. Uh, we mm, decided to include one of the tools that are visible and very much present in every chapter, and that is plastic wheels of emotions. And uh, we refer in the activities very strongly to emotions using this wheel, as you can see on the slide. So the core question um, the core questions are, what do I feel, for example, when I encounter a piece of content in social media? Does it annoy me? Or perhaps it causes rage. The first uh, chapter in, is about introducing the concept of emotion and also the will to both of the educator and the 
young people, and then they are using the wheel basically every chapter in the majority of the uh, activities. So they are also able to work on their emotional intelligence, and we also encourage them to uh, use the proper names of the emotions when they are not sure what they feel. So perhaps uh, some of content, some of the posts, uh, videos on TikTok, YouTube, etc., may cause rage, making them feel more eager to share hateful or inaccurate content. And we have uh, specific uh, activities to tackle this issue. Or perhaps information make them hyper excited and uh, let down their vigilance and results in their participation, for example, scam competitions and losing personal data or and money. We also have activities that allow to bring such discussion uh, to the class or the group, depending on the content. Um, we believe that the emotions are more important than we think, and misinformation feeds on them. And this is why we and our partners design all of the activities to teach children to check their emotions and regain control. So basically the whole curriculum uh, is about regaining control over what they do and how they feel when they are spending online. And this core concept leads later to building personal resilience to this information. Mm. We also decided basically um, using experiences of our partners to uh, use the framework of COPE's learning cycle. So each activity has four steps and it, it, it's creating this cycle. Mm. They are designed in accordance to the COPE cycle, which is a four-step learning process. The I experience is the first step when kids jump into an activity. And I will give you an example in a, in a minute. Then we have the second step, which is um, I reflect. And when young people discuss their observations, um, their feelings, what they had just experienced in particular activity. Then uh, we have this uh, third step, which is I gain knowledge. And this part is a boost of new knowledge, usually um, delivered by the educator. And it's very contextualized. It fits to the activity. And the part of the knowledge uh, is uh, implemented, also incorporated to the whole curriculum there. Each chapter has this um, knowledge nutshell for the educator, so they know uh, in advance what uh, what are some not only definitions but maybe mechanisms that is that are worth knowing and being aware of and the fourth the last and um, the, the core key step is um, about building this direct connection that will link between this information and the young people's everyday life in, in this, the, the fourth step is uh, what, what we call this, I see a connection and build a resilience. And it means building a relationship within those everyday situations and, uh, and a often misunderstood topic of, uh, a difficult topic of myth or disinformation. The activities are very creative. Um, for example, uh, you can also see here on the slide uh, one of the pages coming from the fourth of so the gray chapter. Uh, they are um, also divided. They, they consist of um, some basic information like the length, um, age of children, uh, needed materials, also the links to pre-prepared presentations and any other materials that might be useful uh, for, for the educator. And I also promised to give you some of the examples. So here, here is one. It's called Filters. And it comes uh, from the fourth chapter um, dedicated to breath, to our self-awareness. And the uh, activity is called Filters. So we start with this creative experience that would be I experience. When students divide it into, for example, pairs, use art materials depending on the context might be just drawing or using something more creative and they create a filter for social media 
consistent with the randomly selected description. So for example, they are receiving a dis description that they are uh, a beauty blogger or they are somebody who is very shy or um, wants to protect privacy online and so on and so on. So later, so they have fun, they create the filters. Then on the second stage, we uh, search for this reflective observation. So after activity, students reflect on why people, like why they chose to use filters in social media and why people in general. So we try to spark um, some also difficult uh, discussions or on, for example, that we might be the actors that mislead our uh, others uh, online and, and that this might have consequences for us. Uh, for example, when we are going for a date or, or so that's for uh, some uh, older, older um, young people. Then we go to this abstract conceptualization. So basically in saying more simply, we want to deliver some new puzzle of knowledge and the educator based, of course, using the curriculum has a, some pieces of knowledge that are quite helpful and might be uh, delivered to. So if they explain, for example, what are uh, what are filters um, and, and, and other mechanisms. Um, and um, the last step is active experimentation. So students write down what they are, uh, what uh, other situations they embellish reality to make themselves look better. For example, uh, in the eyes of uh, of uh, of others, and you can see on the right side of the slide a picture uh, of uh, one of the groups that were <laughs> having fun with the activity. One of the uh, younger uh, younger um, younger kids. Uh, so our main idea, besides uh, focusing on emotions, was um, making it fun, especially the green chapter involves a board game called Octogram. Uh, this uh, is a team game that is so based on cooperation, no, no rival, rivalry, and it involves outsmarting the algorithm and connecting um, the so-called bubble nuts. So people who are living in the future and being trapped in information bubbles. And our task is to build connections between them by building some common stories. So if we, if we have one person uh, interested in cats and the second interested in dogs, so we try to build some story that they met somewhere, for example, to, to create those um, friendships and build some common stories using uh, social media re reactions learning about misinformation, deepfakes, multitasking, info stress, and, uh, and, um, and other mechanisms, because the game gives us cards that um, impede or um, help impede our success or uh, help us to proceed. So for example, when we have to deal with deepfakes, of course we have some of, uh, it makes the game a little bit harder, that if we, for example, take care about our digital well-being uh, in the game, it gives us some of the bonuses. It also, what is interesting, the game also includes some of the physical activities. So, for example, we have also a part of stretching in the game and something that helps uh, the players even move around, even though it's a typical card game, but we introduce these physical activities a little bit to make it more engaging. There is a video instruction uh, on YouTube that helps to understand and navigate the game. Uh, maybe a little bit more about the uh, project implementation that might be uh, interesting from uh, your perspective. Um, we divided our work into five main stages. And to spur some of the technical details, I would just summarize uh, the workflow by explaining what went well and what was the challenge and our lessons uh, learned. So the crucial moment, at least in my opinion, and the most challenging moment was the project beginning uh, because we needed a very solid needs analysis to not just the desk research and our own discussions, 
but we really wanted to avoid producing unwanted materials that, that would later only collect dust on the internet. So we met with partners and experts uh, and discussed what was the most relevant at that moment and also where were some missing spaces. And we identified that those educat educators working in the non-formal context uh, are the group that um, could receive additional help because of the lack of such projects in Poland in our partner countries. Um, before the main work, we organized, uh, so before we even started thinking about the activities and the, um, the whole concept about emotions, we organized a focus group with educators to test the idea, um, the structure uh, of the body of the body parts of the five main chapters, the leading questions and these uh, metaphors of uh, head, hearts and emotions, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So we wanted to check whether this will be understandable, interesting and also answering the real needs. Again, to avoid producing materials that uh, are only the, the outcome of another project that is available online. The key moment was our first TOT, so the training of trainers um, conducted in Warsaw. So that was after the preparation of the materials, the first version of the materials. So we met with 20 non-formal educators and we tested some of the activities on them. And later we asked them to test the curriculum with the young people at schools and et cetera, et cetera. So in their natural environment uh, with, uh, for example, some of them worked in um, child, child care houses, others work in sort of therapeutic centers um, and so on. Uh, later that we collected the feedback, we had another TOT for the same group. Uh, and based on their hints and needs, we improved um, the all of the activities and the, the overall publication by, for example, uh, creating the short presentations and also making um, maybe suggesting the online and offline versions because some of them uh, raised the concerns that, for example, at their facilities, they don't have money to print something uh, or that they don't have computers or they had other challenges. So we uh, made uh, the materials as accessible as possible. And then uh, the localizations and disseminations uh, were going very right since the product was built according to the needs, at least in Poland, but also the partners from Spain, uh, Czechia and Romania were uh, present from the beginning of the, of the research project. And also we were checking which group is feasible and possible uh, on their end. So that was something very um, important from our perspective. Oh, so this is uh, something that I've already described that uh, you can see the first group from the TOT that were on the left testing the activities. So this is the, uh, the left and the center photo. And then you have the same educator from the center photo testing the activities, in that case, the octogram game uh, in the field. So at the therapeutic center, in that case, the therapeutic centers are the facilities when uh, where Polish kids can attend after schools in the situation that they have a very bad situation at home. And, um, and, the, and you also supplemented the curriculum, something that is written, a publication in PDF with visuals. Um, we have a couple of them. One is the video instruction of the game. We also have an introduction to each chapter recorded by the authors of the activity. So in that case, it's me and my colleague from the Magok Association on the left uh, screen uh, on the on the slide. And we also consulted them um, when it comes to language. So it's accessible and understandable for the children. We also work with one of the teachers and show them the scripts to actually make sure that this, not, this is not something that is too abstract. Uh, and they are available in Polish, but with the English 
subtitles, while the whole curriculum is available also in, in English. Um, so to go into the summary and the wrap up of the, this presentation and fake no more in a nutshell, I just would like to encourage you to uh, take this uh, materials and use them in your own practice if they fit. I believe this is a unique approach to address this information through the lens of emotions and this everyday experiences of young people and not only young people to basically everybody because we all experience uh, cognitive biases uh, for example mm, and nowhere else you will find such a comprehensive toolkit designed to foster this resilience uh, of, of young people and uh, of course if you have any feedback um, I would love to hear that so thank you very much and I'm open to uh, to questions thanks all right. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Uh, we are going to move to a uh, discussion portion of this webinar. Uh, so we want to hear from you. We want you all to hear from each other. Uh, I've dropped some discussion questions in the chat along with the uh, list of reference materials just because I saw some interest in the reference materials in the mm -hmm. chat. So during this time, you can feel free to check out the list of materials. Uh, bear with us for a minute, a minute while we separate you all into breakout rooms. All right. Uh, I hope you all got a good chance to get to know each other a little better and to kind of reflect on all the information we've given to you. We really want to hear back from you before we get into our, our Q&A portion. So uh, I would love to ask a few of you what you all discussed while you were in there. Would anybody like to share? Katrina, I see you raising your hand. I'm, I'm going to actually make a quick shout out and put someone on the spot. <laughs> Wes, as we got, Wesley Fryer, as we got kicked out of the room, I was just telling our, our little group about some of your websites and some of your uh, curriculum that you have available for other teachers of middle school or high school, because we were looking at how do you do some of this in the classroom? There's the emotions piece, but then also other pieces. And we were talking a lot about um, the online versus offline work and the emotions as it relates to, you know, Alessandra was talking about the, um, you know, some of the filters and some of the arts and crafts stuff. And some of that can be do, done online or offline. And so sort of looking at that, and I know that Wes, you've done a lot of collaborative work projects where while your students might be using the online component, they're working in groups. And I think that really brings up a lot of skills that students need in the media literacy environment and a chance for those students to discuss their emotions with each other. So I'm putting Wes a little on the spot, but um, I don't know if anyone else from my group wanted to say anything. Thank you. I dropped a link in. I, I teach a middle school uh, lesson I call Brain Hacking Info Picks. And uh, I love Inside Out. I don't know if you all saw the second version that came out this summer. It's so fun. But that is really a great context of how media and all kinds of emotions, not just fear and anger and negative things. So um, anyway, that link, anybody feel free to use that. And I, I, those kinds of examples where we respond with a similar framework as what's been described today, I think is a, a really engaging way to have some good discussions about how emotions are activated and, and how we can be manipulated and how we need to be aware of that. And we use the SIFT web literacy framework to talk about trying to investigate the source and decide if they're to be trusted and trusted coverage and that stuff. I'm really loving the sharing of resources in the chat. I think that's all great. Uh, would anybody else like to share what you all talked about? Um, this is Barbara Harrison. Um, we talked about that the um, project, project Look Sharp in Ithaca, New York at Ithaca College is a great resource in terms of curriculum that goes from K through 12 in any in all subject matters and it's free and different places to get news, the museum, the news literacy project. Um, and there was um, something that Sarah had pointed out, the Guardian from Britain. So that was a little bit of what we talked about. If anyone else would like to say, please 
to. I was intrigued. I to... had a... Go ahead, Rachel. I just had a question. I mean, I am a um, sociology professor and I teach, um, you know, I teach a media and ed class and it's always been like kind of academic and I'm just really wanting to like shake it up because I'm just seeing how like disengaged students are. And so I guess my question to you is like, what of these resources could like, like kind of be adapted for like higher ed like thinking about university students and and what they need right now to like navigate <laughs> all this yes i believe they could be ad ad adopted to the um, um, older students also um because they give you a lot of space of changing like a subtopic for example uh, inside. So, for example, from the very basic other activities, like there is an activity called common, so common things, where where people are finding some common, something that they have in common to, like in, in general, something that they have in common. So basically, you could um, just narrow uh, the space and, for example, use your subject and and that would give you the opportunity to discuss something that is common and then go to the part with this information and so on. And there is um, also the uh, the activity called the deleted app that basically um, is a little social experiment. Uh, and we know that the educators were able to proceed with these activities, although they thought in the beginning that that would be impossible. So the students are, or the kids, children, it could be teenagers or even students, I can imagine, if you have a good contact with them. Uh, they initially check their screen time, discuss their emotions, uh, for example, if they imagine the situation with no access to the cell phone or social media and so on and so on. But on the second step, uh, they are asked to delete one of the apps for, for a day. So for example, if you have a uh, contact with them and uh, it probably requires a kind of relationship. So they actually together want to delete the app and then to know what happened, whether they were actually able to function or maybe they installed uh, something like they reinstalled it after an hour because of these uh, all of the negative emotions that they experienced or they possibly that was the experiences of some of the uh, high school um, high school um, pupils that I've heard of that they for example installed instead games Etc. So they needed some of the, you know, some kind of the re replacement. And after that, we had a really good um, feedback on the very meaningful discussion. So this is something that I believe can be done by the 15 years old, but also the 25 years old. One of the educators uh, also shared the story of a family uh, going, one of the kids' families uh, going on a vacation and trying the same uh, activity where the parents were the ones that were unable to uninstall a social medium from their phone. So I believe that this is something that we can all do uh, regardless of the age. All right. Well, I think we are in our Q&A portion officially. Um, Wesley, did you have a, a question earlier? I saw you unmuted. I was just going to say, and I put the links in, Randall um, shared two great game-based media literacy projects. One's called Escape the Echoes, which is further along, and then Bring Truth to Fear. I would love any kind of other interactive games like that, because I really think that is a great way to engage students, and I'd like to do more of that with my middle schoolers this year. So if anybody has other links or a collection of those, would love that. Um, and then I had a question for our speaker. Is there a, a digital version of the of the game you were describing that like we could play? I know you can download it, but like that we could actually, you know, play electronically and that I'd love that link or is that's probably on your website too. Yes, I'm sure. I'm, I'm, I'm putting that uh, on the chat. So the game is, is a card game. 
so uh, what you can do, we have the um, offline, offline like printed versions, and some of the educators received the printed versions. But for those who didn't have the chance, we also have the uh, electronic version, but you need to print it because it's a card game. So maybe the yeah. next step would be to somehow adopt it, but I'm putting that on the chat. It's not printable, uh, it's not editable, sorry. It's not editable, but the license, somebody asked about the license. So until you don't make money on that, it's fine if you also adapt it somehow. So feel free to cool. uh, to to do so to do that. Um, Thanks. And then uh, we we had a question in the chat earlier about the activity with the photo filters that you mentioned. Uh, and the question was, what online tools or apps do you recommend students use to do this photo filter experiment? Yeah, we designed that as an offline activity. So basically using a sheet of paper and whatever art materials, could be just drawing, painting, or crafting something, scrapbooking, something else to actually um, make it more offline instead of online. But I can imagine a joint activity even conducted on Zoom when um, kids are drawing at home and showing the results. But if you have, if you know any apps that actually allow the collective um, painting or drawing that this, um, share it on chat that I would really love to see that. If you have an idea, that would be great. So basically that was designed as something that is done offline so they can actually put their phones on the side and draw something, do something by, um, on, by their own hands. But that could be done online, why not? All right, we have about five minutes left at this point. The floor is open for any questions and comments. I just had a question about this is to anybody like just um, more with respect to like our political, <laughs> you know, just the like what, you know, the political context, I guess I'm talking specifically in the US, but also with respect to just, you know, climate change and so many things happening in the world. Um, just wondering if anybody has any resources that are maybe more like activist oriented or more oriented towards like, how do we define democracy? Um, how do we define, um, you know, how do we look to, how do we look to the media both, you know, in terms of like disinformation, but also as a space to like mobilize. Thank you, Rachel. I put two links in the, in the chat. One is for Courageous Arai how to use media literacy to depolarize. You have conversation and educational tools when there's difficult discussions in the classroom. This is a program we're coming to an end and we'll do a different iteration in the fall. And then beneath that, there is eco-media literacy, the work of Antonio Lopez from John Cabot University in Rome, who has resources to teach about uh, the environment from a media literacy uh, perspective. And there's a lot of tools there and lesson plan and things to uh, do. Yes, and Facing History, a great, great resource as well. And Teaching Tolerance is another one, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll also add that Pen America, who I've worked with, has a lot of really great civic engagement resources. They do a lot of education and advocacy around um, free speech and First Amendment issues, and they're very anti-book banning. All right. Well, we have two minutes left. If there are no other questions, um, then I think we will wrap things up here. So thank you very much for joining us today. The Media Education Lab will be back uh, with the first of our new Spanish speaking webinar series next Thursday, August 15th. I will drop a link in the chat if any of you are interested and would like to register for that. Um, so thank you again, Alexandra, for taking the time to speak with us all today. Uh, Alexandra, how can we contact you in the future? Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn by using my name and surname, so Alexandra Monkos, 
or contacting me through mail and I'll start putting uh, my email on the chat. So feel free to reach out if you would love to adapt the curriculum or have any questions and I'm really happy to help and uh, assist you. Good. Well, thank you again for joining us. Thank you all for staying to the end. I hope you got a lot out of this. I hope you bring it into uh, whatever space that you are practicing media literacy education in and have a great rest of your day or night. Thanks so much.